the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all of the good things and blessings that we may have overlooked. And we thank you for this Thanksgiving week, a secular holiday and reminder to us of our need to every day be grateful, every day come to your Thanksgiving table, your Thanksgiving meal in the Eucharist. And at times where that has been sparse and the opportunity to gather and connect in person has been difficult, we know that you are still God and that you still reign and proclaim your hope to each one of us. And so we pray tonight as we dive into your word, we would hear those words of hope that you have set forth for each one of us to receive. Help our ears to be open and our hearts ready and willing to receive whatever you have in store for us. We ask your blessing upon each one of us in the ways that we most need it, our, your blessings upon this time, and all of the intentions, distractions, or worries on our hearts. We lay them at your feet, Lord, and ask that your will would be done. We pray all of these things in your most precious name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to our weekly Monday Night Bible Study. So good to be with all of you who are here live, or those who may be watching later. This evening we will be in Mark chapter 13, verses 33 through 37. So if you want to pull that up in your Bible, or you can go to that link, which is the United States Bishop's website with the daily readings for this coming Sunday. Uh, as always, if you are joining us for the first time, we will read through this passage twice. The first time through, we'll just get a picture for what is being said. And the second time through, we will listen more deeply to see how the Lord is speaking to us individually and any questions, reflections, or thoughts that that reading provokes. Uh, then we'll have an opportunity to share, and then we'll dive into further study of this passage. Um, so we are in the Gospel of Mark. And since we've been in Matthew for so long, some uh, opening notes about Mark, I think, would be helpful. So the Gospel of Mark was the first gospel written of our uh, four gospels in the New Testament. And it uh, was used by Matthew and Luke. They used it as a source and pulled the direct quotations or direct lines from Mark in, their, in both of their gospels. And so we know Mark predates them both, probably written around 20 to 25 years after Jesus' death. And it um, proclaims Jesus as the resurrected Lord, the one who defeats darkness and evil. And so Matthew was very much about showing that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah and fulfilled Jewish prophecies, himself being a faithful Jewish man. Mark is more about, let's get the message of this victorious Lord who rose from the dead out to all of the world. And so the image for Matthew of Jesus is that of a man, but the image for Jesus in Mark is that of a lion. Uh, and so that power, that victory, that overcoming all evil, that is kind of the tone of the Gospel of Mark. It is also the shortest because it was written with the intention to just get this message of hope and victory out to everyone. And so uh, we'll be reading from a section of Mark that is very similar to the section we've been reading from in the Gospel of Matthew in the previous weeks. Uh, but that might be a little bit of the difference in tone and word choice that we might see um, in this Gospel. So that's all I'll say before our first reading through. We'll begin in Mark 13, verses 33 through 37. It is once again in the chat for those of you just joining us. Um, so first time through, just get a picture for what is being said. This is Jesus speaking. Um, he's in Jerusalem, but he's actually speaking privately on the Mount of Olives, right outside the city of Jerusalem, to Peter, James, John, and Andrew. Only those four disciples. Be watchful. Be alert. You do not know when the time will come. It is like a man traveling abroad. He leaves home and places his servants in charge, each with his work, and orders the gatekeeper to be on the watch. Watch, therefore. You do not know when the Lord of the house is coming, whether in the evening, or at midnight, or at cock crow, or in the morning. May he not come suddenly, 
and find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to all, watch. The Gospel of the Lord. So in this uh, passage, this again is towards the very end of Jesus's public ministry before he is going. Uh, you see right after this in chapter 14, they start talking about the conspiracy against Jesus. He's anointed and then betrayed and arrested and the last right after the Lord's Supper. And so this really is um, where in, in Matthew, last week's gospel, yesterday's gospel was his last public discourse. This is almost like his last private discourse outside of uh, the things he says at the Lord's Supper. And instead of being in front of the temple area in Jerusalem, he has just left that area and he is talking privately to those four of his disciples, those three who are closest to him, James, John, and Peter, and then Andrew who gets the in because Peter's his brother. We don't have any other instance in scripture that I recall where it's just those four um, so Andrew lucks out here because he's he's in the know and related to um, the number one Peter. So um, that's where they are. They're at the Mount of Olives right outside of Jerusalem. Um, and they're asking Jesus, um, when will this happen? What sign will there be of the end times? This happens earlier in Mark 13. So Jesus goes through a series of teachings and uh, little para uh, parable-like stories comparisons, and this is the last of those that he gives. Um, so that maybe paints the picture of where they are, who this is being said to, um, a little bit different than, than yesterday's gospel of this past week from Matthew when he's talking to this big group of people, but similar tone, similar content. So second time through, this time get a picture um, for how this reading is impacting you personally. Is there any particular word or phrase that stands out to you? that resonates with you, any particular question that comes to mind, thought, image, or idea. Again, this is not to necessarily interpret the passage, but this is to ask yourself, how is this speaking to me? What do I notice? And what about that? What is God trying to say to me through this passage? And what might he be compelling me to do? So those are the things to think about and reflect upon the second time through. Um, to uh, write those things down, highlight them, underline them, whatever you need to do to remember them and begin to ruminate on those things. And then we'll have an opportunity to share those or ask any questions after the second time. Mark 13, 33. Be watchful. Be alert. You do not know when the time will come. It is like a man traveling abroad. He leaves home and places his servants in charge, each with his work, and orders the gatekeeper to be on the watch. Watch, therefore. You do not know when the Lord of the house is coming, whether in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or in the morning. May he not come suddenly and find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to all. Watch. The Gospel of the Lord. So I invite you to take a moment to look back over this, see what resonated with you, what questions arose as you listen to this, and why you think the things that stood out to you stood out. And uh, feel free to share those things in the chat, or once you um, know your question, or if you want to share it out loud, you are uh, share your reflection out loud, you're welcome to unmute yourself and do so. If you're watching this later, feel free to pause and do that together with whoever you're with. But whenever you're ready, feel free to do that in the chat, or uh, unmute yourself and share or ask away. Matt, the, the part that gets to me is, is basically the the... Third sentence, you do not know when when the time will come. And I think that, that can address so many things in our life, whether it be when Christ comes to you, when you have that miracle, or when it's our time to, to leave the earth, this earth. And mm -hmm. the second coming. I mean, it's so many things that we need to be watchful for. And I think that's the part for me that resounds the most in this gospel. Mm. Thank you.
And what stands out to me is the the fact that he leaves his home and each servant has their own work to do. And it kind of shows us, um, we've talked about it with confirmation of 13s where we all have our own gifts and we really want to work on those gifts that God has given us. Um, so I think it's important that like we all have a reason as to why we're here and, and a reason for what we're doing. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you. I like the terminology at the very end. Uh, be watchful lest coming on a sudden he find you sleeping. And I don't think sleeping to me means asleep. It means complacent, uh, just uh, everything's okay, you know, and um, I don't need to do anything more, that kind of thing. Mm. I always think of this passage when I hear people saying that we're in the end times now or, you know, it's all coming to an end because unless Jesus was mistaken, we aren't going to know <laughs> in it's end time. I mean, a lot of things look like it could be, but I would guess that during the Napoleonic Wars or the Black Plague or there's been a lot of really devastating times in humans history in the last 2000 years. And, you know, it could be the end, but we could go on for another thousand or more years. So I, I, this is the first thing that pops into my mind. It's like, Jesus doesn't make mistakes. So if he said, you're not going to know, you're not going to know. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think I just have one statement and it just kind of hit me. I, I guess I don't really think of the reality of the end for me. You know, you're just so thing. You, I don't think about the end, which you know intellectually, but it just kind of hit me. Yeah, might want to think about that. Yeah, yeah. I, when I when you when you read it the second time, I kind of changed my focus. I know Advent is really kind of a a complex season in the church because we're preparing for Easter but we're talking about the second coming but there's the third thing to me and it was at first I was thinking more of the the 10 virgins and I don't want to be the ones that get missed out but I think mm -hmm. when I heard that 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 comment about watch it really hit me to say I have to find God in the presence and I have to watch for him in my daily journey and in the people that he brings to me to encounter and that mm -hmm. that's a real part of being watchful too and not being asleep. Yeah. Thank you. I like I, I like that comment that you just made. Um, somehow when we were reading and listening, I was thinking of last week's gospel and talking about uh, you took care of when you, when you took care of the hungry, you helped clothe the all those things that we're supposed to do. And he said, well who when did I do that? You, whenever you did it to the least of my brethren. Somewhere in my, my head, I heard either a comment last week or something over the weekend in the Gospels that we need to be looking for the image of God uh, in all in all that we meet and who we meet. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, it's really easy just to lose track of that. And uh, not even in a nasty way, <laughs> not even in the thinking about the the election and all the hard feelings and thinking about how crummy you think some people might be but but just like you just mentioned every day we have we have all these opportunities to uh to observe or be with people or, or really to listen i guess not just watching but to listen to them and uh and see how we can help we hope well, great. Thank you so much for those um, comments and reflections. Um, if you have any more, please share them in the chat or save them toward the end. Um, there's only five verses here, but there is a lot in this passage. Um, you know, it's funny. Anytime I prepare for Bible study, I, you know, tell my wife, like, oh, my gosh, there's only five verses. And then I'll get into it and be like, oh, my gosh, I think I have way too much now that I want to say. It's amazing how packed Scripture is. Um, so let's get into this. Um, Mark chapter 13, this whole chapter of Mark 
is nicknamed the Little Apocalypse. And the reason for that is that it was the first apocalyptic New Testament writing written. Um, you know, Paul's letters are very instructional to the different communities. He started writing first, the first of which being the letter to 1 Thessalonians. But when the Gospels started coming out, um, apocalyptic literature or sections came up in the Gospels because that was what Jesus talked about the end times toward the end of his ministry. But that culminates in the final apocalypse, uh, the very last book of scripture, the book of Revelation. And this type of literature provokes, especially in a lot of fundamentalist or biblical literalistic circles, a sense of uh, interpreting so that we can solve the puzzle. When will it be? Uh, when will the end times happen? Um, and we all remember the big, you know, um, um, what was it, uh, event of 2012, you know, December, whatever it was in 2012, the Mayan calendar ending. And if one person had just done an ounce of research and knew that the Mayan calendar just restarts when it ends, they would have known that the world would not be ending. But people were predicting, you know, all over the world will end on this day. And as Christians who believe in the words of Jesus, anytime I hear someone say the world is going to end on, you know, October 31st, 20, you know, 20, 27, whatever it is, um, then I can say, oh, great. Well, I'm just going to have a great day that day because I know for a fact it is not going to happen because you just said that. So it will come in a time where we have no idea. We do not know. We're meant to be in this state of anticipation. And so this being called the little apocalypse, it's important to know that apocalyptic literature was a very popular style at this time of writing. And it's not a type of writing that is meant to be interpreted to be solved, but rather it is always a story or a type of writing that is written to a group of people in a time where they are very oppressed, persecuted, or dealing with a lot of suffering or darkness. And it was a literary device used to inspire and bring hope, especially in the themes of victory over whatever that darkness, per, uh, persecution, or oppression might be. And so a lot of the things in the book of Revelation don't necessarily represent the absolute end of time. They actually represent the overthrow of um, the, the Hebrew people and the destruction of the temple in the year 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed. And so a lot of that had already happened. And so this was to write to the Jewish people who were very downtrodden, who were very disconnected, or those new Christians who had been oppressed and persecuted as a result of that to help inspire them to a sense of victory in Jesus Christ. But there is also a lot of imagery in Revelation about the end of time, and we have those things here. So for that reason, Mark 13 is called the little apocalypse. The word apocalypse or apocalypsos in Greek means the unveiling. So to unveil or reveal to us a hidden or inner truth about the nature of God or the nature of Jesus. And so unlike in Matthew... Uh, we see in the very beginning of 13, Jesus is coming out of the temple, but then in verse 3, it says he was sitting on the Mount of Olives uh, opposite the temple area with Peter, James, John, and Andrew, and they asked him privately, when will this happen? And they asked specifically for when and what sign. When will this happen and what sign will there be? And so he gives a lot of different signs in the coming verses. Uh, he says in verse 6, Many will come in my name, saying, I am he. Verse 7, there'll be reports of wars. Nation will rise against nation in verse 8, along with earthquakes and famines. Verse 9, uh, you will be arraigned before governors and kings before me. Verse 12, brother will hand over brother to death. Uh, verse 14, desolating abomination, which points back to the uh, uh, prophecies in the book of Daniel. Uh, verse 22, false messiahs and false prophets. Verse 24, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will be falling from the sky, and the Son of Man will come on the clouds, and that, of course, is Jesus. And then we have this image of the fig tree, um, and then this need for watchfulness, this final kind of parable about the end times. And so what Jesus is basically saying here is that he's giving them signs, but he's not telling them when this will be, and it culminates here in this passage, be watchful, be alert. You do not know when the time will come. You do not know when the time will come. And he even says elsewhere in the Gospels, even the Son of Man does not know the day or the hour. Even Jesus 
does not know. And so to always be watchful, always be ready. But there will be signs, there will be things that we know uh, will come, and it seems like it will be a lot of division, desolation, suffering, sin, um, and the difficulty with that is those things are always present in our world, right? And so there's no way of knowing, well, which suffering is really the suffering that Jesus was talking about, which division is really the division Jesus was talking about. And so there is a need to always constantly be ready. So I say all of that because this Sunday, this gospel is being read for the first Sunday of the season of Advent. We're beginning a new Catholic year, liturgical year. We're going into cycle B of the Sunday readings. And the season of Advent, the word Advent means to prepare. And so it's a season of preparation, but it is a preparation that is threefold. And usually as Catholics, we celebrate only one of these. Usually as Catholics, we celebrate Advent as the season to spiritually prepare for what? The birth of Jesus at Christmas, right? That is kind of what we always do. But that already happened 2,000 years ago. And yes, we remember it and we kind of journey through the beginning of the gospel message and story to prepare for his birth and celebrate that and kind of go through the next liturgical year as a cycle of Jesus's life teaching uh, and all that he wants to reveal to us, culminating in the end of the year with all these prophecies about the end times. However, Advent is also a reminder, bridging to the end of the liturgical year, that we need to be prepared for the end times. We need to prepare not only for what has already happened, but we need to prepare for what will happen. And then the third thing that Advent is meant to call us to, which is the thing that is almost never talked about in the season of Advent, is preparing for and expecting for the birth of Jesus into our lives today, in every single day, every single moment. So there is a past, future, and present form of preparation or disposition that we are meant to call to mind during the spiritual preparations we go through in the season of Advent. It's why it's some, it's has the color of purple of a penitential season, not like the penitential um, type of tone of Lent, but we take that on because we know we need to be spiritually prepared to encounter Jesus face to face, eventually at the end of time, at the end of our earthly life, but also each and every day when we encounter him in others. And so my favorite image of Advent is the image of pregnancy, because pregnancy has this sense of joy is here, but it's also not completely here yet. So in Advent, we can joyfully prepare for Christmas. We don't have to be penitential like we do during Lent and kind of almost this sense of like sorrowful in the desert, you know, woe is me until Easter comes. But Advent, there is that sense of joy. You know, when a couple first finds out that they're pregnant, there that is joy. And then immediately, especially if it's your first child, is then the overwhelming sense of terror, dread, and not knowing what the heck you're doing. And so that's kind of the uh, analogy that is akin to the spiritual life. You know, when we're recognizing, kind of like Margot was reflecting on, oh, we need to be thinking about the end, then all of a sudden we're like, oh my gosh, I need to get it together. I need to, get, I need to do this and that. I need to get to confession. I need to do all these things. Same thing when you find out that you're pregnant. Like, oh, we have to get a crib, a baby room. Where are we going to live? How are we going to afford this? What's it going to be like? And all of that comes, but it all culminates in the most joyful and most climactic moments of your life. And that's why I love that image for the season of Advent. It's kind of this sense of joy, but still preparing for that joy to be fully realized. And so when we hear this passage, we're meant to have that same type of reaction. Joy in knowing that Jesus will return. He will come back. He will redeem us and he will be victorious over all death, evil, sin, suffering, fear, doubt, worry, anxiety, all of it. But also a sense of, oh wait, but I still have things I need to do and prepare and I can't wait forever. You know, a pregnancy has a, a, a ticking clock, as does the return of Jesus. He will come at some point in chronological time uh, in order to redeem us and for the whole world to be brought before him for the final judgment. And so we need to keep all of that in mind. So as we go into this passage, that is why it is uh, bridging us into Lent, I mean, not into Lent, into Advent, why it's continuing this kind of end times apocalyptic literature as we begin a year and how we are meant to uh, use that as a form of spiritual preparation to inspire us as we prepare for not only 
celebrating his birth at Christmas, but celebrating and expecting the way he is born into our lives anew each day. Be watchful, be alert. So this is not just uh, physically alert or physically prepared. Uh, in fact, I would argue that this gospel is um, putting spiritual alertness as much more great a need of preparation than a sense of physical security. So this isn't about like making sure all your, you know, um, your last will and testament is drafted. You know, you should do those practical things. Those are practical things to do. But at the end of our lives, the most important thing is that we are spiritually prepared. So that's the type of alertness and watchfulness that we are called uh, to in this passage. You do not know when the time will come. First of all, that sense of being watchful. Um, in the Roman army at this time, if you were to fall asleep on duty, it was a, um, a crime or a violation that was executable. Like you could be executed or put to death for falling asleep on your watch um, because you put the entire... Um, you know, Roman legion or whatever your group that you're a part of is part of the Roman army at risk if you are the watch person and you fall asleep. And so it was a very um, disrespectful, dangerous, and a criminal thing to do. And so Jesus uses this same analogy of the gatekeeper or the watchman um, to kind of show this very um, intense responsibility that we have to make sure that we are preparing. And then when he says you do not know the day or you do not know when the time will come, there are two words in Greek for time. Chronos, which is chronological time. So if I'm, you know, saying I'm going to the store on Wednesday um, and that will be at 9 a.m. at that time, I'm talking about chronological time. But the word that's used here is kairos. And kairos means like a very decisive or impactful moment in your life. It's not meant to happen like, oh, when you turn this age, in this chronological moment, you always go through this big aha experience. No, it's kind of like, well, the time is now. You know, I don't know if you've ever had a moment like this, a very decisive, important, or opportune moment where maybe a friend or a confidant or someone that you're talking with is just like, well, seize the moment. Like, the moment is now. You have to go after this. You have to get after it. Follow your passions. Change careers. Go back to school. Whatever it might be. It's kind of that type of earth-shattering or transformational moment in time that this word kairos represents. So it doesn't have to fall anywhere chronologically in your life, but when you're in the midst of one, you know it. There's some kind of, it raises you above chronological time, and you know this is kind of a, a hinge or a linchpin in the timeline of my life. This is a decisive moment, a kairos moment. So that's the word that's used here in verse 33. It is like a man traveling abroad. So the man here, obviously, is Jesus. Traveling abroad means he went on his ascension vacation. We don't know when he's coming back. Um, hopefully, someday soon uh, to these people uh, writing in the gospel. And hopefully to us, too. Hopefully, we are anticipating that moment with joy. He leaves home. So for home, it would be not only earth, but the church specifically the institution, the gathering, the group that he came to gather, train, teach, and institute to bring that message of his salvation to the entire world until he returns. So he leaves home, the church, and places his servants, us, in charge, each with his work. I love that Vivian pointed this out, each with his work. It reminded me as she was sharing of these words I don't think are attributed or they're not original to uh, this person, but they've been attributed to him. I don't know if you've heard the recent story of the teenage saint or a teenager who's on the path to sainthood, Blessed Carlo Acutis, who died when he was 15 years old. He was born uh, five years after me, two years after my wife, and so he's younger than both of us, and yet he has died and already on the path to sainthood. He's been beatified. There is, you know, home video footage of him playing PlayStation with his best friends. Like, that's one of our modern saints in the making. Very, very cool. Uh, but he was attributed as saying, even though I don't think it's um, it's him who first said it, each one of us is born an original, but we many of us die as photocopies. And there's a sense in our culture that we are always, even in our unique gifts and talents, even in our originality and the way that God created us as unique sons and daughters, each with our own individual mission and purpose, we tend to look right and left and compare 
and say, oh, what's that person doing? Why can't I be as good at X as them? Why can't I do this like they can? Or should I be trying to go that route because everyone else is? And that's where we fall into a dangerous trap. I think that's something that the devil very much wants us to do. I think the devil wants us all to try and become like each other so that our unique missions and purposes will just kind of fade into the background of our minds and none of us will be working for the kingdom of God in the unique way that God has called each one of us to. I think that's a very sly temptation of the devil using worldly things like achievement, promotions, social media, comparison, all these things that we struggle with, especially in merit-based Western cultures, all uh, about independence and getting ahead, that it's difficult sometimes to see there is beauty in our uniqueness, even if it doesn't look as financially assuring or as successful in the eyes of the world as other paths might. And so I love that phrase to keep in mind, each with his work. What is your work? What is my work? What is uniquely yours? I and only me can be the best Matt Zemanek on this planet. You, None of you can do it better than I can. But I can waste that mission my entire life trying to be the next Bono or, you know, whoever. I don't know why he was the first person I thought of. But, you know, I can be whoever. I try and be as good as they are, but I will never out, I will never out Bono Bono. I can't be better at being Bono than Bono is. He's the best at it. And so I would be robbing myself of the unique mission that God has called me to if I did that, as the, would be the same with all of us. And so what is the unique work that you've been called to? And if you want to know what that question or the answer to that question is, simply look around to where God has placed you. God placed you at this moment in time. You could have been born in, you know, Renaissance Europe. You could have been born, you know, in the army of Attila the Hun. You know, you could have been born in all these different times and places on our planet or in our history. But you were born in this time, in this place, to your family, in your friendships, in your workplace, in your community, because you have a mission in all of those places. So what is your work? What are your daily duties or responsibilities? How can you be faithful in small matters? So that God will give you great responsibilities, as we heard several weeks ago in the parable of the talents. That is what it looks like to practice proper discernment and to ask God, what is it you've called me to? What is your plan for my life? Is to simply look around at our life and fulfill the responsibilities we have. And when new opportunities and uh, doors open, to pay attention to how the Lord might be lining things up or leading us in certain directions. And if no doors or windows are opening, then maybe we're called to continue to be faithful here and now in this place. So, question to consider, what is your work that you're being called to do as a servant who has been left in charge? Continuing in verse 34, he orders the gatekeeper to be on watch. Now, I, to tell you the truth, I'm not sure who the gatekeeper is. Because uh, elsewhere in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the gate, I am the door. No one comes to the Father except through me. But Jesus here is not the gatekeeper. He's the man who's traveling abroad. And so it would seem to me, you don't have to take, you can take this with a grain of salt. You don't have to believe me. But uh, because he's talking specifically to Peter, James, John, and Andrew, these kind of chief group of the 12 who is, you know, his, his first bishops, this closer-knit group of, of apostles, it would seem to me that this, the gatekeepers, are those in leadership in our church. The Pope, the bishops, um, those who have been tasked with the um, job of being evangelists, being missionaries, being those who represent the church, people even like myself, maybe, who are called to share that message. That we are held to a responsibility that is not just that of the servants, that of the whole church, but of being those who kind of are the gatekeepers of this me this message. And there's a responsibility there to know that, you know, we can't let anything into the gate. We're meant to be on guard. But also there are times when we have to open the gate and welcome people in or let people out. And there's a sense of responsibility there. And so I would argue that anyone who is an active disciple of Jesus Christ is in a potential position to be a gatekeeper. It does not have to be one who is ordained or who has taken official vows but if you consider yourself a leader or a representative of authentic discipleship in the church, then maybe this is you and maybe this is me. We are the gatekeepers and we are called to be on the watch. Verse 35, watch 
therefore. This word watch that comes up in Greek is Gregore. Um, and Gregore is a word that was often associated with actual watch or guard duty, as we've talked about already. Uh, and we'll see why that is important. But it is also used in uh, 1 Peter, a very famous uh, passage from 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verse 8. And that says, be sober or be watchful. It's the same word there, Gregore, and vigilant. Your opponent, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, how interesting that the image of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark is the lion. And yet the lion that we are called to be watchful of is uh, the devil in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. I don't know how many of you um, have uh, read the Chronicles of Narnia, um, but there's this line, I can't remember what character says it to what character, but they're talking about Aslan, the lion, who represents Jesus. And they say, um, you know, well, is he dangerous? You know, he's a lion. Is he dangerous? And the person's like, of course he's dangerous. He's a lion. But he is good. But he is good. If we're talking about the devil, now the devil is not equal to Jesus. Um, I actually saw this new book coming out by Father Robert Spitzer, and it's something about like Jesus versus Satan, um, the battle uh, between good and evil in our souls each day or something. And I was like, oh, cool. But I don't really like that title because it's not Jesus versus Satan. You know, the equivalent of Satan is St. Michael, the archangel. Jesus is so far above and so much more powerful, so much more good. It's just overwhelming the victory that he will claim at the end of time over all evil. And so we can't pit these two against each other as if they're equals. But if we were to classify the devil as a roaring lion seeking to devour, devour us, it would end there because he is not good as the lion of Judah, Jesus, is. And so... There's a sense of watchfulness that points also to um, that idea of being sober, being vigilant, being wary of all of those attackers that may be out there. And this points back to the passage I mentioned where Jesus says in the Gospel of John, I am the gate. Uh, because he talks about in there those who try and sneak or um, steal the sheep out of the gate. And those would be those doing the works of the evil one. And so it's as if Jesus was saying, I am in this position but now you will be in this position that I'm in. I'm instituting you. I'm creating an office for you to stand in my place to protect those in the church. And so there could be an argument being made that this is specifically about those who are ordained. But I think there are many people in leadership in the church who could either protect and evangelize on its behalf or cause scandal because of their position, regardless of if they're ordained or not. So... Watch, therefore, you do not know when the Lord, the word there, Kyrios, is um, a word used for God himself that is often also used for Jesus. The Lord of the house is coming. And now it's interesting here, the times that are offered are not normal times someone would arrive. You know, if you're like, oh, I'm having a party next Saturday, um, you know, and, and I'd love for you to come over. But I forget to tell you the time. You would not assume that the party is at midnight or at cock crow or in the morning, maybe in the evening, but like most of these times are not times you would generally expect a guest to arrive or something to begin. You would generally see someone saying, oh, I'm flying into town on Tuesday. Can you pick me up from the airport? Um, you know, we, I think many of us who've picked people up from the airport now have learned, oh, what time are you coming in is the first question you ask before you say yes, because we automatically might generously assume, oh yes, all flights are coming in at noon, a very convenient time. Like, oh no, I'm catching the red eye. Thank you so much for picking me up. So this is not an expected set of times here, but the times that are offered, uh, whether in the evening or at midnight or at cock crow or in the morning, these are all hours of actual watch in the middle of the night. So evening is first watch, that's from 6 to 9 p.m. Midnight is 9 to 12, 9 to midnight. Cock crow is midnight to 3 a.m. And in the morning is 3 to 6 a.m. So the original words there are used in Greek actually are the names for those specific times of guard watch. And so if you ever see in different passages, you know, in the third watch of the night, when I believe one of the passages when the apostles are out at sea and their ship is being tossed and Jesus comes to them walking on the water. I think that's in the third watch of the night. 
Things like that are always referring to these kind of watches that were part of guard duty uh, being an official in the Roman army. And it just became kind of part of culture for any other group that needed to be watching. Those who protected cities or citadels, those who were looking out for enemies, or those in the military. This was a specific set of times that they were very familiar with. All of which, you specifically have a watch person there um, to determine... Um, you know, is someone going to come in the dead of the night? If it's in the middle of the day, it'd be very easy to see them. You could be nonchalantly looking out on the road and see someone coming. But I, I just want to paint this picture really clear because if it's in the middle of the night and you are the gatekeeper, you are the watch person, you know, you have no partner, no alternative, no backup. It is you. And you know the safety of this army or this city depends completely on me. I want you to imagine the vigilance that these guards had in the middle of the night for three hours just staring, eyes wide open, ready to see any movement, ready to an announce the alarm that someone might be coming. It's not this just kind of like, okay, I'll be awake and I'll pay attention. Uh, okay, I'll go to church and I'll kind of do, do what I have time for. It's No, there is a vigilance in this. It's just like, I am ready. A sense of complete perseverance, determination, to expect the presence of Jesus to come. That is the type of vigilance that the Lord is calling us to spiritually each and every day as we respond to this call to discipleship. Verse 36, may he not come suddenly and find you sleeping. I'll point to what Sandy said. Yes, we can interpret this as kind of that complacency, you know, that spiritual sleep. Uh, it's often called in the catechism and in theology, um, achedia or acedia, which is the um, deep spiritual sloth or spiritual neglect that causes us to not um, have hope, to not try, to not have any desire or will to do anything that is spiritually good for us. That is, um, it's called the noonday devil. It's um, something that is, is a very sneaky one of the seven deadly sins that I think many of us, especially in a culture that promotes comfort as one of its chief ideals, uh, many of us might struggle with, you know, a sense of, oh, I can do that tomorrow. Oh, I just want to sleep in today. Oh, I just want to have a nice lazy day. Um, you know, there are areas in the world where that type of phrase would sound so foreign. Like, what do you mean? Like, you're going to have a lazy day. Like, if we don't work today, we don't eat today. Like, what, what does that even look like? You know, we should have that type of vigilance of people in the world who have to do certain things every day or they will not survive. We need to bring that same tenacity to our spiritual life. If I don't do these things every single day, I will not survive. And so what is the spiritual equivalent for you for going and collecting water or going and harvesting grain or going and doing the things you need to you would need to do in another country to make sure you could eat every single day? That is the type of vigilance there. We cannot you cannot sleep through those things or your family will not have food. There's a proper time for sleep. It's not that those people don't sleep, but they sleep at the proper time at night when the work has been done. And just like the parable of the 10 virgins, when the watch or when the, the master of the house comes, they are prepared. They are ready. They have done everything that has been asked and expected of them that day. They have earned that rest. And when they wake up, they're ready. Nothing is waiting to be done or been put off to tomorrow. What I say to you, I say to all, watch. And there is that word again, Gregory. It's actually a, a different conjugation of that verb, Gregorite, um, but it still means keep awake or be vigilant. Now, what's interesting here is Jesus tells this to these four apostles. And then um, just later in the very next chapter, when they are in the garden, um, in verses 32 to 42, this is when Jesus goes and he tells them, stay awake and keep watch. And he goes and prays and he comes back three times and they're sleeping. They're actually sleeping, even though he told them five minutes ago. Like it was longer than five minutes, but it seems that way when you're reading it, like literally just told them, do not fall asleep. Stay awake. Literally don't fall asleep. So it doesn't, it doesn't just have a spiritual meaning for us, but it's ironic that there is a very physical interpretation of this, a very real literal interpretation of this that the apostles immediately fail at, at their next opportunity um, by falling asleep on the watch. And what does that lead to? But Jesus's arrest. 
Now imagine how devastating that would have been for those four apostles. They were there asking Jesus this final question in this final moment of teaching before this culmination in the Last Supper. And they know why he's come to institute this new Passover. They know that he will come again. They know that they have to be watchful, vigilant, and alert. And they go into the garden. He goes off by himself. And what does he say? Be watchful, be vigilant, be alert. And what do they do? They fall asleep. Not once, not twice, but three times. And what happens immediately after that? Jesus is arrested, tortured, killed, crucified, and buried. What a magnificent failure they must have felt like that day. And it's comforting to me to be reminded of that, that the very first bishops, in fact, the very first pope of our church, were redeemed from very human and very magnificent moments of failure. I have felt some pretty magnificent moments of failure lately with just the whole situation with a leak in this house and doing things wrong and feeling like, man, I cannot catch a break or get anything right or get this done in a timely fashion and trying to make sure my kids are okay and our family has a place that's safe to be. Um, and it's just, it's just so hard sometimes to not be just completely hopeless or fall into that desperation. And so I'm comforted in passages like this and knowing and even those people who saw in the flesh what Jesus did, they succumbed to those human moments too. But there was always redemption from it. There was always another day, hopefully, to respond to that call to vigilance. And so I think as we read this passage, as we enter into the season of Advent, as we hear it proclaimed this Sunday, and as you reflect on it throughout this week, I think there are many things to glean from it. But one being, what is the work that you've been called to? And how are you being called to stay watchful and vigilant in that work? But also, how can you receive this as a passage of comfort and victory, even over the moments where you feel like you have failed lately, or that there is no hope? Because Advent is the season of hope. It's the, you know, hopeful anticipation is kind of the, the hallmark motto of Advent. Hopeful expectation, hopeful anticipation, which is why, again, I love that image of pregnancy for Advent. And so how can we be reminded of that and have that in moments where we feel like, man, everything is falling apart. I'm just, I don't have it together. My life is a mess. Um, I'm struggling because of the holidays and who I can see or can't see and all of this pandemic mess and all of the division. And, um, you know, a heated election year and then gathering with a diverse opinion, opinionated group of potential relatives on Thanksgiving to hear all that played out once again. You know, it could be a very stressful and very um, depressing or very dark experience in the midst of even more darkness and depression. And so please receive this passage with encouragement. I think a lot of times we read apocalyptic literature and we interpret it too quickly as the doom and gloom or the church pressuring us to just kind of be better or you're going to go to hell. And that is, was never the point of apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic literature was written to a group of people who were already in desolation. They were already feeling defeated. And this was written to encourage them to say, hey, stay the course. Keep being faithful. Because there is no darkness so dark that a single light cannot illuminate some part of it. And so keep that light going. And if it's gone out, spark it again. And eventually the light will grow and other lights will gravitate toward it. And before you know it, you will be being warmed once again in the bonfire of the Spirit. Gathered with other faithful, like-minded people. In a joyful season, in community outside and on the other end of this darkness, this trial, this situation, whatever it is you're facing today. So receive this with encouragement and know that God is bigger. And this Advent is a reminder that he proved that 2,000 years ago, that he can prove that he's bigger than everything, even coming in the most humble of packages. Have faith in that. Be encouraged in that as you hear this passage this week. Um, and let us continue to pray for one another. That is all I have for you for this passage. Any final thoughts, questions, reflections, anything I missed or that you're still curious about or that you would like to, to share? Please uh, send it in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself.
Uh, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Pete Rose, the famous baseball player who's been banned from everything. But one, of his, <laughs> one of his sayings was, every pitch is a new day. And uh, that's an important lesson for, for all of us, all life. But especially for athletes, is you can't be moping or grinding or sad about what just happened. You've got to be ready for the next play. And uh, yeah. if we just screwed up and didn't see Jesus and the person we just were visiting with, time goes. And a moment later, there's another opportunity to see that person or someone else. So we, we just have to be alert all the time. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing that I was thinking of as you were talking about the watch gatekeepers is that what a when you think of parents, we're the gatekeepers, we're the watchmen of, of our of our families. And uh, mm -hmm. we had a whole lot of babies and they were all, all very close together. And I don't know how Maureen, it didn't matter what time of night it was, she heard it. And, uh, mm. When we started to get outnumbered she couldn't be to everybody then I heard it too because sometimes it was an elbow on the ribs but and it was at you know that three o'clock hour or something you had to take part in the, the activity so <laughs> yeah anyway, these messages are, are giant things that we're talking about but they're they're daily living daily instances in our lives so absolutely thinking about these four that you said were gathered there with Jesus and if if uh, Peter, James, John, Andrew was there too, but if Peter, James, John um, saw Jesus walk on water and cure lepers and be transfigured on the mountain in his full glory and they still disappoint you know they still didn't have enough faith or stick to it of us um it's a good lesson for us that you know they who were even chosen um they fell down sometimes and mm -hmm. jesus still loved them I, I like to think about that. Yeah. You know, there, there are a lot of moments like that. And there's that passage when Peter walks on water and then he sinks and Jesus, you know, immediately stretches out his hand and says, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And everyone always interprets that as Peter's doubt in Jesus. But I interpret it as Peter's doubt in himself. And the apostles, I think, they look at, you know, Jesus and they say, well, that's, you know, that's great for you. You know, like, look at all the things that you can do, but you're telling us we can do these things. And I'm just a guy, like, I'm just a guy who was a fisherman and not a very good one. And and now you're calling me to be a fisher of men. Remember, I wasn't a good one. You know, I wasn't good before. And Jesus keeps compelling them to this mission that they probably feel perpetually that they are going to fail at. And so I think it's less a confidence in who Jesus is, but more of a lack of confidence in who they are and who they're being called to be, which is why I think that phrase, what is the work that you've been called to, or that each one with his own work is so important, because otherwise we can very much be overwhelmed by failure. Um, I want to close with this. John reminded me of this. You know, I, I share this with teens a lot when I talk about failure, but another baseball analogy is that, you know, um, a batting average, a very good batting average in baseball is about 300. And the best batting average ever in history, I think, was a 406. And that was Ted Williams when he batted for the Boston Red Sox. Well, a 406 means 40.6% of the time when you go to bat, you will hit the ball. Um, that's 59% of the time you will fail. You know, 40% on the test is still an F. And so failure is not necessarily a set of circumstances, but it can be also a mentality that if Ted Williams went to bat and said, well, 59% of the time I'm going to fail, so why even try? Then yeah, he would have been a failure. But he looked at it as like, wow, 40% of the time I'm going to connect and that's better than a lot of other people. So I'm going to keep being the Ted, Ted Williams baseball player that I can be. And he became the best in history. So it's a, it's a mentality to keep in mind in those moments where we're feeling really downtrodden and overwhelmed. Um, keeping in mind this Advent as Jesus is calling us to prepare to not look left and right, but to look inward. What is what I'm called to do? 
And how is he calling me deeper into relationship with him? So it is 8.30. Let us pray. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, thank you so much for this time, for um, this opportunity to prepare for this exciting season of Advent. And even though it comes every year, with each year you provide new opportunities for us to have hope. And boy, do we need hope more than ever in this time and place, um, in this Advent season in 2020. And so we pray that you would bring that hope to us this week in the encouragement of others, the encouragement of your word, and help us to be faithful to all that you have called us to. We pray all of these things in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.